This is Ezra, not Ezra, Ezra, Nehemiah. This is the second lesson. Let us rise up and build. Lesson number two, God stirs up the builders, the builders' hearts. Little review, we're studying the period of biblical history that describes the return of a small portion of the Jewish population that had been held in exile for 70 years. Uh, go back to our graphic, historical graphic here, kind of put people in perspective. Uh, from 721 to 587 BC, during this period, the 10 Northern tribes uh, were scattered and relocated throughout the Assyrian Empire and they were eventually assimilated by the new lands and cultures where they, uh, where they settled. Uh, this was Assyria's way of uh, dealing uh, with uh, conquered people in order to crush any type of uh, future threat from old enemies. You just spread them out to different countries. Eventually they assimilated the culture and the religion of those people and then they, you know, they no longer uh, were a united uh, uh, people. The Babylonians who defeated the uh, southern kingdom, uh, they had a different approach uh, to conquered nations. They would train the best and the brightest of the defeated nation in order to supply the king with a diversified pool of advisors, a much more enlightened uh, approach, if you wish. And this explains uh, you know, Daniel and his friends uh, the treatment that they received and the, and the, uh, the, um, the uh, training that they received. And so the account of the Jewish return from exile uh, begins with the, uh, the book of Ezra. So uh, in our graphic, we see here the uh, 721, the fall of the Northern Kingdom, the prophets that deal with that particular time period, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Nahum, and Habakkuk, and in the world, of course, Israel is carried off into foreign lands. Assyria uh, is uh, eventually conquered by the uh, Babylonians and the Babylonian empire established. Uh, and they, uh, uh, they eventually in 587, uh, they conquer the Southern kingdom, uh, Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon and carry off the people into captivity, 70 years as was prophesied by Jeremiah, who was one of the prophets of that time period, who wrote uh, also Lamentations. Ezekiel also is a prophet. Ezekiel was a prophet that went with the people into exile. That's his, you know, uh, his historical position. Daniel uh, was already in exile. Um, uh, uh, in the Babylonian Empire. Um, uh, and of course, in the world, the things that we're interested in, as far as the biblical history is concerned, uh, Judah is in Babylonian captivity. There's the rise of Daniel to a place of uh, prominence in the Babylonian uh, court, if you wish. And, and then the Babylonians themselves are defeated by the Medo-Persian uh, Empire. Uh, and yet the Medes uh, keep uh, the, um, the Jews uh, in uh, captivity. So let's begin Ezra, because he's the one that tells the story of the return of the, uh, of the exile. It says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in uh, Judea. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a freewill offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the father's households of Judah and Benjamin uh, and the priests and the Levites arose. Even everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle and with valuables. 
aside from all that was given as a free will offering. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house uh, of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, uh, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of uh, Judah. Now this was their number, 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls of a second kind, and 1,000 other articles. All of the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Sheshbazar brought them all with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. And so Ezra goes back in time to describe the first effort to encourage people to return to Jerusalem and the, uh, <clears throat> and the surrounding uh, area. Cyrus um, was the king who defeated the uh, Babylonians. And one of his very first acts as king was to return all the exiles to their former nations and help them rebuild or renovate uh, their temples. When we say all the exiles, we mean all the exiles that were in uh, his uh, nation, not just the Jews, all those who were exiles were encouraged to go back to their uh, countries, including uh, the Jews. Uh, this decree that he made, uh, known as the Cyrus Cylinder, was especially favorable to the Jewish nation and their God and the cylinder uh, exists uh, today still and is on display at the uh, British uh, Museum. Now, uh, Cyrus uh, may have practiced what's called henotheism, which is the belief in many gods, but the worship of only one God. We see hints of this in the way that he refers to God as the God of heaven, who gives kingdoms to kings, but who belongs only to the Jews and dwells only in uh, Jerusalem. We read that in verse two. So what are the, whatever the, the depth or quality of his faith, we're talking about Cyrus now, uh, it is evident that God has worked in his heart because the decree is quite generous uh, in its terms. We don't know, you know what the terms were for other nations, but certainly uh, for the Jews, it was very, uh, very uh, generous. After all, he permits all who wish to return to go without any conditions. Of course, the conditions are taxes, no taxes. You know, there's no special, you know, if you pay a certain tax, you know, the rich people, if you pay a certain amount, you can go back to your home. No, anybody who wants to go can go. Uh, he also encourages those who were uh, Jewish, but were remaining in Babylon to provide funds for the journey and the work of rebuilding. So the ones that didn't go, he encouraged them, well, if you're staying, that's fine. Help your brothers who are going back to you know, Jerusalem, help them with gifts and money and so on and so forth. And he himself, Cyrus himself, donates the gold and the silver articles that are in his treasury that were originally taken by the Babylonians when they captured Jerusalem. The idea uh, in those days, when you conquered a nation, you took its idols and its gods and its uh, you know, silver and so on and so forth to demonstrate that your gods are more powerful than their gods because now their stuff is in your treasury, uh, in your temple. So he, you know, he uh, empties out everything that was taken uh, from, the, uh, from the temple. So we continue reading in chapter two, he says, now these are the people of the province who came up out of captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon and returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his city. These came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Saraiah, Reliah, uh, Mordecai, uh, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Baana. So in chapter two, Ezra uh, will name a long list of names and households of those who chose to return to Jerusalem. Uh, these include families, um, priests, Levites, slaves, along with animals. Everything uh, was numbered. They counted how many calf, how many cows they brought, how many sheep, how many donkeys, how many people, you know. It was a complete count of everything uh, that uh, was brought back. Now, one of the reasons for the listing of families 
was for genealogical purposes. You see, they were returning as the people of God to their promised land. Their genealogical records proved them to be true Jews. You know, I'm a Jew, I'm from the family of Jacob. Oh really? Uh, how do you know? Well, we, lo we were looking at the genealogical record. Well, there I am right there, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, all the way back to uh, whatever, Jacob or one of the 12 tribes. So the, the records were very important and they used the records uh, in order to um, uh, uh, legitimatize any of the individuals who wanted to return to the promised land. Ezra's record also establishes that his account described real people dealing with an historical event which was momentous for them and important historically for future generations. It's not a fable. It's not a fable. It's, a, it's, a, it's history. And that's why Ezra is very careful in you know, naming names and animals and you know, counting everything. Uh, it's a historical record and not, and not, a, uh, not a fable. Uh, the record also established in real time the actual beginning of Jeremiah's prophecy to return the captives after 70 years. Let's just read that. We talk about it, but this is in uh, Jeremiah 29. He says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Now, Jeremiah made this prophecy long before the Southern Kingdom was destroyed and the people were carried off. Uh, he was telling them, you know, you, you need to repent, you need to stop doing this, you need to stop worshiping idols, blah, 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 because you know, the Lord's gonna come in and wipe you out and the nation will be destroyed. And he kept warning them and warning them, nobody paid attention, kept warning them. And then near the end of his prophecies, you know, Jeremiah 29, he makes a prophecy that says, okay, you will be destroyed and you will be carried off, but there's hope in 70 years, God will bring you back. And so Ezra is making sure that he records everything in real time uh, in order to uh, justify and to confirm uh, that the prophecy of Jeremiah was actually fulfilled in real time uh, and in real uh, history. In addition to this, Ezra's record gives historical fulfillment to Isaiah's prophecy concerning a foreign king who would eventually serve as a savior for the Jewish nation. And Isaiah uh, uh, made this prophecy two and a half centuries before any of this ever happened. And let's just read it, it's just a couple of verses here. It says, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. I Isaiah made this prophecy, two and a half centuries before Cyrus was even born. Isaiah makes this prophecy. So Ezra is very careful uh, you know, to write down everything that's taking place, who uh, you know, is making the declaration uh, that the Jews uh, are free to return and so on and so forth. So at the same time, he demonstrates that not only Jeremiah's prophecy for 70 years has been fulfilled, but also Isaiah's prophecy who spoke the actual name of Cyrus two and a half centuries before any of this uh, even uh, took place. Just an amazing, uh, um, uh, amazing uh, proof of the uh, inspiration uh, of uh, scripture. So now a couple of things to note about the long passage of uh, names and, and uh, numbers. Uh, first of all, in, uh, we're not gonna read all of that, just wanna comment on them. Uh, in Ezra chapter two, verse two, you note that the names, their names, you know, he said, these came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reeliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvai, Rehum, and Ba'ana. Uh, you notice uh, a little confusing, you see Nehemiah and uh, Mordecai. Uh, you have to understand that uh, the name Mordecai and Nehemiah are mentioned here, but they're not necessarily the people of 
Esther and Nehemiah's book, all right? Uh, these were fairly common names for that time, you know, like John or uh, Roger or Paul or something like that. You know, they were common names. So these are not the, uh, the Nehemiah here and the Mordecai here are not the names that we read about in, the, in Esther. Okay, just a small note. Uh, and verses uh, 36 uh, to 39, uh, he says, the priests, the son of Jediah of the house of Jeshua, there were 973 of them, the sons of Emer, 1,052, the sons of Pashur, 1,247, the sons of Harim, 1,017. What's important about this here is that we note that there remained only four families of priests left among the people who could legitimately claim descendants from Aaron. I mean, before that, they had thousands and thousands of priests. They couldn't use them all. They had to kind of have a lottery to see which one you know, would serve and so on and so forth. Now there's, there's only four families of priests um, uh, that are left. And uh, he names them and how many people there are in the family. Uh, another interesting uh, note, verse uh, 55a, uh, these are all lists, so I'm not reading all of that, I'm just kind of highlighting some of the you know, uh, interesting uh, lists that he makes. In uh, verse 55a, he says, the sons of Solomon's servants. You know, why mention these? You know, that the sons of Solomon's sermons, uh, uh, servants, they also went back uh, with the group that returned uh, to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, why mention them? Well, the idea was to restore as best as they could the worship of the temple. Uh, they were going to rebuild the temple, but also they were going to have the original plates and cups and instruments used in the worship that they used to have. Uh, they would have legitimate priests, you know, those four families, legitimate priests, uh, legitimatized by going back through the genealogies to make sure that they were truly descendants of Aaron. So they're going to have legitimate priests. They had garments. They were going to have the, the legitimate garments that the priests uh, wore. Uh, Levites, even, you know, Levites were coming back. Levites, they were servants in the temple. They assisted the priests in the, you know, the worship, so on and so forth. And then he mentions the sons of Solomon's servants. Well, Solomon's you know, uh, even the descendants of Solomon's original servants. In other words, there was continuity with the past. What was the job of Solomon's service? Well, you know, they, they, they mopped up, they cleaned up, they, they, they manned the doors, they did, you know, did all kinds of uh, uh, jobs uh, in the temple. And, and, and uh, Ezra is saying, we even have the descendants of these servants that are coming back with us who will take uh, on you know, the jobs and the tasks that their forefathers had uh, when the original temple was built uh, by Solomon. And all of this done to restore as closely as possible the temple and the worship as it was in its purest form during the time of Solomon's original temple. Then we read in 61 to 63 the following. He says, of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who took a wife from the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and he was called by their name. Of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who took a wife from the daughters of uh, Barzillai, the Gileadite, and he was called by their name. These searched among their ancestral registration, but they could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. The governor said to them that they should not eat from the most holy things until a priest stood up with the Urim and the Thummim. So this is simply confirming what I've said before or what was said. Uh, there were four families of priests. All of them had to prove that they you know, were related back to Abraham, Abraham. Uh, back to Aaron, uh, and then he mentions several of them who you know, thought that they were part of the priestly uh, lineage, and when they tried to prove it, they couldn't. They couldn't find them in the records, and so they were officially 
you know, barred from the priesthood, meaning they couldn't eat of the holy things, the sacrifices made in the temple, so on and so forth. They couldn't, they couldn't offer them and they couldn't eat of them until a decision was made with the, uh, you know, the umum and the uh, thumum. So a great effort was made to authenticate the priesthood so that if no written record existed to support a claim that one belonged to a priestly family, they were not permitted to serve in the uh, temple. Um, one of the uh, interesting things about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, you know, by the Romans, this is after Jesus died, after his resurrection, you know, uh, 30, 40 years after the uh, resurrection, uh, we know the story that uh, the Romans came uh, and uh, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the city, they killed the, the people, it was a terrible uh, massacre. But the most uh, uh, damaging thing that they did in 70 AD, the Romans did, is they destroyed the genealogical records that were kept in the temple. That was a death blow. Because you see, when, 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 when uh, the Babylonians went in, they, they took all this stuff, the records, the plates, the spoons, uh, you know, everything they did during worship, they, they carried all this off with them. And so the Jews had access to these things when they returned. They could verify who was a priest and who wasn't a priest. But in 70 AD, when the Romans went in to destroy, they destroyed everything, including the genealogical records. So now after 70 AD, there was no possible way that anyone could verify if they belonged uh, to a priestly family, which uh, you know, uh, completely annihilated the possibility of ever uh, uh, offering uh, public worship in the temple uh, again. Uh, and so even if the temple could be rebuilt today, uh, there would be no way to determine who could legitimately serve as a priest in the temple. That's why 70 AD is such a critical uh, event in the history of the Jews. As I say, this was a true blow to the Jewish nation in 70 AD, not only the destruction of their place of worship and their nation, things that could be replaced in time, but the destruction of their priestly succession, which could never be uh, replaced. Now, that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to 70 AD, now let's go back to the time of, uh, of Ezra. Uh, in 70 AD, yes, the, they destroyed the city, the people, the temple, the records, and uh, the priesthood. Uh, in, the, in, the case of, um, in the case of the priests in the time of Ezra, and you know, the return from Babylon, those who could not confirm with the records they used the Urim and the Thummim. Um, they were uh, to decide, you know, they used these things to decide the matter. These were, uh, they were sacred lots. They were used by the priests to find out the will of God. We read about that in Deuteronomy 33 and 1 Samuel chapter 14. There are lots, the priest kept them in, uh, in the pocket of uh, his breastplate there. Uh, something like dice, something like that. Uh, you could get a yes or a no answer in the way, you know, depending on the way they fell. So they would ask God a question, they would you know, uh, consult the Urim and the Thummim, and uh, they would either get a yes answer or a, a no answer. It was a, a way that they determined these things at that time. Um, finally, in verse uh, 68 and 69, uh, Ezra writes, some of the heads of the father's households, when they arrived at the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered willingly for the house of God to restore it on its foundation. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for the work 61,000 gold drachmas and 5,000 silver minas and 100 priestly garments. So uh, finally, Ezra, he counts the collection. He counts the collection and he records exactly how much was given towards their uh, mission. Uh, 61,000 drachmas or daeks of gold, that's a Persian weight. Uh, 5,000 minas of silver, that's a Jewish weight. Uh, one mina is 20 ounces. And 100 sets of priestly garments. And so the people are counted, the supplies are collected, and the return from exile finally begins. 
So we've got a lot more text to look at in both Ezra and Nehemiah about what happened when they finally you know, returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the city, rebuilt the wall, all that business. You know. um, and we'll also read out of Haggai, the prophet Haggai and the prophet Zechariah. But before we go on, there's a couple of important lessons to note from just this, just this preliminary background lesson and review. This was just the setup. We're gonna actually get into the, you know, the return uh, next week if uh, God is willing. I just wanted to bring out a couple of lessons uh, that we can draw just from what has taken place so far. Lesson number one, God can stir anybody's heart. God can stir anybody's heart. Note that both King Cyrus and later King Artaxerxes were moved to be generous and kind towards the people of God for the good of the people. There was nothing in it for Darius that the Jews go back and rebuild their temple and you know, the people, you know, 50,000 people go back and they rebuild their city. What's in it for him? It didn't increase his prestige. He didn't make any money out of it, you know. No, he acted because God, God you know, stirred his heart. And these men, you know, Darius, for example, these were not soft men. Men, you know, they didn't watch Oprah in the afternoon. <laughs> these were not men who had a social conscience. They were kings who came to power and they fought for power and they ruled with absolute power. They had the power of life and death and they used it and didn't lose any sleep over it. The penalty, for example, for speaking to Artaxerxes without having been invited to do so was death. Imagine that. Imagine you spoke before you were spoken to and the penalty that you paid was death to show how important and how absolute the power of the king was. These were not soft guys. Oh, I know that God served, uh, stirred the Jewish people and he called Ezra and he called Nehemiah and he called Zerubbabel to do his work. But these people were already servants of God. They were seeking his will. They knew uh, the word of God and, and what it promised in regards to the return of the people. They were open to God. They knew his voice. They wanted to hear from him. But these kings, they were ignorant of the word of the prophets. They listened only to their own voice of reasoning or perhaps to the magicians and the astrologers at court, but not to the God of uh, and the laws of the Jews, they were not swayed by those things. And yet the Bible says God stirred them up somehow. We don't know how, could have been a, a dream or an insight, a thought, a compulsion of some kind. It's not really important how, what's important is that God knows how to stir every soul into his service. It doesn't matter if it's a king or a cup bearer or a zoning inspector or a landlord or a contractor or a banker or a council member for the city that you live in or the president. When it comes to his people and their welfare or their ministry, God knows how to stir the hearts of those he needs for his own purpose. And we need to remember that when we pray. When we pray, you know, we're not wasting our time when we pray, God, please raise up leaders in our nation from, from you know, the lowest, uh, you know, the local, local mayor, the smallest city, uh, to uh, cabinet ministers and uh, uh, presidents and vice presidents. You know, we're not wasting our time because we're going to the one who actually has the ability to stir the hearts of these people according to his will and purpose. And we have an example 
of it here. We think the president is powerful, but the president, you know, the way it works in this country, you know, his power is mitigated, you know, by the way that our government is put together. But in those days, the king had absolute power. He didn't, you know, if, if he didn't want to do something, he just didn't do it. So God can stir anyone's heart. And, and the access to that is prayer. And the reason sometimes things are not moving in the direction we'd like it to move is because the people who have access to God in prayer are not praying. They're not taking the time to pray for those kinds of things. You know, there are bigger things in the world than God, please help my foot to stop hurting. God, please, you know, uh, I hope I get that promotion. That's fine, but there's a bigger picture. There are bigger needs out there. There are people that we can influence through our prayers to God if we pray. So that's one of the lessons that we learned just from this preliminary, you know, information concerning the return. Another lesson. God does not force us to respond to him. The new king gave everyone a chance to go home as free men after years in exile. The new king provides all the resources to restore the national religion, which was the center of their, the Jews' previous life in Jerusalem. We see that the people collect a fortune to get the building program and the worship started again. And thousands of people from every walk of life are gathered and committed to return to their homeland. And their action is the actual fulfillment of the uh, known prophecy of Jeremiah. Everybody knew Jeremiah's prophecy and they were actually living out the completion of that prophecy, but but not everybody chose to go back. Did you, did you think about that? Some just stayed behind in Babylon with their business interests and their land interests and their homes and their new status quo. You know, oh man, go back to Jerusalem. I just finished building the addition on the house. The crops are finally starting to come in, you know, the business is starting to make a little money. Go back to Jerusalem, oh dear, I gotta rebuild the house and go back to the little, go back to Bethlehem, are you kidding me? That little tiny town. Why should I do that? I mean, we got a good here, why should we go back? Others were content to make a donation to the cause but not get involved because reestablishing the temple and worship to God, living in the promised land, waiting for the Messiah, it just wasn't important for them. You know, the synagogues in Babylon and the temples of their new homeland, these were good enough. Why bother going back? Why make a sacrifice for God? didn't seem practical. And then some didn't go because Babylon was now their true home. Their parents did not teach them the law. Their parents neglected to train them in the ways of the Lord, in the ways of the past. And so when the call to return finally came, 70 years later, they couldn't understand that it was for them. Why? because the parents didn't pass the promise on to the sons and to the daughters. It works the same way. You know, God comes for us in various ways. Oh yes, uh, there are the most dramatic ways, you know, uh, he comes for us in death. That's one way he comes for us. When we die, that's God coming for us. He's coming for our souls. And then of course, uh, he's going to come for all of us when, when he returns at the end of the world. Uh, there's that coming for us as well. But he also comes for us in other more subtle ways also. 
Sometimes it's a stirring of our life or the stirring of our heart to lead us in a new direction of greater service, greater purity, greater commitment, greater holiness. You know, your conscience or your heart tells you, you can do better, you can live a holier life. Who do you think is speaking to you when you have that thought? It's not your flesh. It's not the evil one. He doesn't say things like that to you. Don't be confused. You have the desire to do better. You have the desire to become a, I want to be a holy man. I want to live a holier life. Where does that urge come from? Well, it comes from God. Sometimes it's a vision of what should be or what could be or what needs to be done in order to glorify God or in order to expand his kingdom. Sometimes it's a thorn in the flesh that leads us into deeper and more dependent relationship with him. You wanna become more dependent on God? Get sick for a couple of years. I guarantee you that'll draw you closer to God. Just get sick for a couple of, not a couple of days, a couple of years. Get sick where nobody can tell you what's wrong with you. Where there are 10 different diagnoses. Get sick like that. See then what happens. See then how easy it is to move closer to, closer to God see how less important the things of this world become. Whether you're sick with something you don't know about or you're sick with something you do know, but nobody can cure. Sometimes, as I say, it's a thorn that we have in our flesh. Sometimes it's a wayward child. We've tried everything, said everything, done everything and they just won't listen. They won't hear, they won't change. Boy, if there's anything that drives you to your knees in prayer, it's a wayward child. I think many of us have experienced that. What is certain is that he does come for us many times in our lives and we respond in different ways. Some, like the people who stayed behind, ignore their call and they miss the blessings that are attached. Others like the kings respond in part, but not with a complete faith and trust in God. They unwittingly serve God's purpose, but refuse to exchange their earthly kingdom for a heavenly kingdom. And then there are those who give full acceptance to the movement of God in their lives and they become the temple of his glory. They become the holy temples of God. So remember, God doesn't force us to respond to him, but he does call us. He calls us and we need to be sensitive to his call. And then quickly, number three, God can bless his people anywhere. Note that in Ezra chapter two, verse 64, he totals the number of people returning to Jerusalem at 49,897 people. That doesn't count the people who, div who decided to stay in Babylon. That's just the people who decided to go back. In Jeremiah 52, 30, Jeremiah said that 4,600 people were carried off into captivity. Wait a minute. 4,600 were carried off into captivity. 49,000 came back 70 years later. That's a tenfold increase just there while in exile, while being enslaved in a foreign land. And according to the money and livestock that they had when they came back, it seems that they prospered while they were in exile. How does that work? A broken people ripped from their homeland in a brutal war, forced to live in a strange country with no rights, no natural wealth and no leadership. And these people multiply their population over 10 times as well as their wealth. This is how it works. 
God is not limited as to where, when, and how he will bless you. The bottom line is, is not where you live, it's how you live. It's not where you worship, it's who you worship. It's not rich and powerful you are, but how rich and powerful God is. God can stir you, bless you, multiply you, defend you, equip you, and commune with you wherever you are, because whenever his faithful children gather or wherever they gather, he is pleased to be there with them. Keep in mind the words of the angel to Zechariah in Zechariah chapter four, verse six. He says, this is the word of the Lord uh, to Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, it isn't about your power and it isn't about your might, it isn't about your intelligence, it isn't about your ability, it's about God's power and his ability that's what makes the difference in our lives. So those who would rise up and build anything from a new life to a new church need only to remember that if you respond to God in faith and obedience, He will build for you, through you, to His glory forever and ever, uh, amen. And so the last lesson is God can bless us no matter where we are, no matter what conditions we're in. But God, I'm, I'm, I'm sick, I'm weak, I, I don't feel like it. I don't, how can I be of service to you? He'll use you. God, I never felt better in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm in the force of life. My mother used to say to Michel Tidane, la force de l'âge, you know, when I was 40. Our youngest son just turned 40. He's in the strength of age, as we say in French. God can bless you at 40 in the strength of age, but he can also bless you at 70. It's just, are we listening? Are we paying attention? Are we calling out to him? That's what's important. Okay, well, that's our lesson, kind of a couple of lessons just to set up everything. Next week, we're gonna dive into the actual move and what takes place and so on and so forth. Thank you for your attention.